Hey everyone, it's Colin. How's it going? Just a real quick one for you this time around, but I'm out at Free Geek and look at what came in. An in-box Performa 400 with its matching monitor. So the 400 was actually one of the first three models of Performas that Apple introduced in the very early 90s. The Performa 200 was just a rebadged Mac Classic 2. The Performa 600 was a rebadged Mac 2VX, so that was the highest end unit. And then this was kind of your mid-range option. It's a rebadged Mac LC2. So let's start with the machine itself. It has been opened. This, you know, clearly has been a used set, but it's been retaped closed. And based on the weight of the box, I'm hopeful that it's got everything in it. The sticker on the front is just a little faded, but it kind of gives you an idea as to how this was a much more consumer focused version of the Mac. It included a bunch of software that was really meant for kind of home use, right? At ease was kind of a simplified version of the user interface. Claris works kind of like Microsoft works. If you know, you bought a PC from around that same time, uh, floppy drive, 80 meg hard drive. I believe this thing came with, yep, yeah, four megabytes of RAM. It was a 16 megahertz, 68030. Came with a keyboard and mouse. What's interesting is that it actually came with the keyboard. A lot of Macs from this time period, they would only include the mouse inside the box and you'd have to buy a keyboard separately, usually for about a hundred bucks. Some people say that's kind of a cheap way of doing it and Apple just trying to make more money. The other argument is that Apple had many different models of keyboards available during that time period. So you wouldn't end up in a situation where they maybe included a basic one in the box, but you wanted the extended one and you'd have to buy a second keyboard at increased price. So it's depending on how you want to look at it, it's either good or bad. Check this out. Dayton's Marshall Fields Hudson's Dayton's was I don't know if they were outside of Minnesota. Obviously, I live in the Twin Cities, but they were a department store chain. So Dayton's wasn't a computer or electronics chain. They weren't like Best Buy or CompUSA or Circuit City or anything. They were like uh, kind of a ritzy version of JCPenney, that sort of a thing. But that's exactly what this Performa series was meant to cater to, was to kind of a more general retail market. You can see $1,700.95 for this guy. That's really neat that the price tag is still on here. So let's peel the tape off of here. Take a look at what's inside. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Definitely used. The keyboard shows some yellowing. And here's what I mean about that keyboard, right? Like this is kind of the standard keyboard that Apple typically sold at the time, but then there was an extended version with, you know, more keys and the numeric keypad and way better switches and that sort of thing. And then this accessory kit is really neat to see. Yep. So it's missing. It looks like the documentation and then the floppies, but the original mouse, power cord, ADB cable, and even the microphone all included in here. So that's neat to have. And yep, peeking through the styrofoam. Also a bit yellowed, kind of hard to not have them, but look at that, they even put it back in the bag. Wow. But uh, yeah, Performa 400. So yeah, the machine's actually in pretty good shape. I'm not seeing any chipped or cracked plastic. You can definitely tell where they had the monitor <laughs> sitting on top of this thing just by where the yellowing is. And I think this is kind of proof positive that the yellowing definitely happens, at least due to some part with UV exposure. But I'm guessing that whoever owned this probably used it for just a few years, just enough like for the yellowing to happen. And then they upgraded to a, a different machine and put the thing back away in the box. Um, ports across the back, microphone, speaker, ADB for keyboard or mouse, SCSI for external CD-ROM drive for this machine would probably be the most popular thing someone would hook up. Modem and printer, serial ports, video output, and of course power supply. 
And then this is a cover for what's called the PDS or processor direct slot. It's an expansion card interface. A lot of machines from this time period that Apple was putting out, kind of the early 90s, 92, 93, came with these. Uh, you could get like network cards and stuff. One of the most interesting cards for this slot would have been the Apple II card. It would include a connector on the back that would go to a breakout cable and allow you to hook up like an Apple II joystick and an external floppy drive. And the card actually contained all the circuitry for basically an Apple II system, right on a little card. And with companion software running on the Mac, you could use Apple II applications which was really neat for some schools that had really big Apple II software libraries and wanted to upgrade to the Mac, or if at home you had a bunch of Apple II games that you really liked or whatever. Those cards are actually not very common anymore, and I believe they go for a decent amount of money, but that was another common use for this expansion slot. All right, so I very gingerly popped these tabs that hold the cover on, and then you hinge it forward. I just want to see... If there's any obvious damage in here that we need to address. The fan's a little dirty and that's kind of to be expected, but the big thing, this battery has not blown up yet. That's gonna be coming out like right away. These batteries, especially in these earlier machines from again, the late 80s, early 90s, these have a tendency to literally explode. Um, it's the internal, it's kind of the same thing like that. What happens with electrolytic caps is, you know, pressure builds up inside them and then they start to leak out. The thing with these batteries is they don't normally just leak slowly. The pressure builds up and then they burst. And when they do that electrolyte will just corrode everything that it touches. So if you have an older machine, just take these batteries out, especially these little, they call them half, one half double A size batteries, pull them out. You don't need them for the computer to work. Yeah, the clock will, won't be accurate, but who cares? Uh, looks like it's got the original hard drive in here, 80 megabytes. Quantum, these were SCSI hard drives. Uh, it also does not look like the machine has ever had its RAM upgraded. So it's got four megabytes of RAM soldered to the motherboard, but the expansion slots are empty. So this thing basically is just completely stock from when it was new, which is actually kind of neat in and of itself. It's fun to see upgraded machines, but at the same time, I think it's also fun to see original ones that just haven't really been messed with. I am, as probably to be expected, seeing some signs of capacitor leakage on this board. It doesn't look severe. I think this is all stuff that could be cleaned up and fixed, but that's the other thing that you need to do with these older machines if you can. Take the battery out first and foremost because those will still do the worst damage, but these caps, the electrolyte that leaks will absolutely eat away at traces on the motherboard. It'll lift pads. It'll get underneath chips and become a massive pain. Like electrolyte is probably hiding underneath chips like these. So you need to really clean these boards very well. If not, just take the chip out so you can clean underneath it and such. Uh, it's a scourge, really, unfortunately, that afflicts a lot of these older machines. But at this point, they are 30 years old, I guess. What are you going to expect? So here's a little uh, interesting tidbit. So like I said, the Performa 400 was really just kind of a rebadged LC2. Obviously, you've got floppy drive on one side, hard drive on the other. So you've got the floppy drive cable on this corner of the board and the SCSI cable on this corner of the board. Apple only did some kind of minor tweaks to the original LC to turn it into the LC2 and Performa 400. One of the interesting things was the original LC could be had without a hard drive. You could get it instead with two floppy drives to save money. Here's a remnant of some of that. This is the header where the second floppy drive would have connected instead of the hard drive. Here's the cutouts in the top case that corroborate that. So here's the primary floppy drive that is open, as you can see. Look at that. So Apple just reused the existing case mold from the original LC to produce these later versions. And if you had gotten the two floppy version, this would have been knocked out. 
All right, up next, the monitor, also in box. Uh, this is a 14 inch, obviously CRT, 640 by 480. Unfortunately, this monitor was not very high end. In fact, when it was new, it was Apple's lowest end monitor. As I understand it, it's actually just a rebadged Magnavox CRT monitor that Apple put its proprietary video cable on because at this time, Apple wasn't using your typical VGA connector. They had a different one that they made everyone use. But it's what was bundled with the performance. This was really, unless you went to a dedicated computer store and told them, no, I want a higher end monitor. This is pretty much what came with the early performance. And, you know, it, to an enthusiast, it would be a bit underwhelming, but in context at the time when this was new, it looked fine and worked fine. So eh, you can't really fault Apple for going with something that hopefully would help save some people money. The label is unfortunately just barely hanging on on this one, but it was purchased yeah, at the same place, very likely at the same time. Again, Dayton, Hudson, Marshall Fields. Uh, $450 for this thing. Which, you know, considering what a really high-end, like, 14, 15-inch Trinitron-based display would have gone for, you know, that's probably not too bad of a price. All right, peel the packing tape off the top of this one, too. Again, this one has also been opened before. This is a used machine, so... Let's see what's in here. I'm expecting similar, although there won't be any fun accessories that would have been included. Yeah, so here's what I was talking about with the video cable. If you aren't used to Mac video cables from the early to mid 90s, this is what they were. Yes, those missing pins are intentional. This is a color display though, but it's just neat that it's got the styrofoam and everything too. Like a lot of people would just throw the boxes away because you know once you take the computer home, what are you going to do with the box, really? But it's it's fun to see this kind of stuff. It's even more fun to see all the original packaging. Obviously, it makes it a lot safer to haul this thing around. But even being able to just see things like what the original labels and all that looked like, you know, that's all just part of the whole nostalgic experience, regardless of whether you remember these from back when they were new or if this is the first time you're seeing something like this. And here's that display. Something that I always found really weird with this monitor is that Apple never really bothered to brand it. They didn't put the logo on the front or anything like that. It looks like just a terribly generic monitor, which yeah, it pretty much is. Nice to see that the, uh, the door is still on here. A lot of times those would get broken off. Just some basic controls, but that's okay. It's also got the clip for that microphone. The microphone would slot in there and these always usually got clipped to the side of the monitor. I don't know why people would do that. You would think you'd want to put it closer to the front where the mic can pick you up better, but whatever. And then yeah, permanently attached video cable. So it's not modular. A couple more controls in there just for the height and the width. Most of the geometry that you would need. And then the label on the back, this is really the only thing that signifies that it's an actual, you know, Apple produced product. I'm pretty sure that on this thing's original version, you know, that Magnavox made it. I've seen photos where they basically just have the Magnavox logo right across the front here somewhere and that's it. So Apple didn't even really restyle the monitor when they decided to sell it. They just contracted Magnavox to Hey, can you make one without your name on the front and put our sticker on the back and put our custom cable on it? And here's a bunch of money. Yeah, okay, sure. So here's what I mean about that monitor. Like this was Apple's later 15 inch monitor that they sold with Performa models. And you can just see how it kind of fits in better in general. Now this is a Performa 635 CD. So this was a 68040, technically 68LC040 machine, right around the transition between Motorola 68K and Apple going to PowerPC. But it just looks like a much more Apple-like unit, I guess you could say. 
I also seem to remember that the monitor and the computer by this time were actually sold as a bundle. Whereas with that other Performa, the monitor and the computer were sold separately. And if you really wanted to, you could buy just the computer and provide your own monitor. With this, they both actually came in the same box. So the whole idea with Performas was to try and get Macs into households. So they weren't meant for business use. They weren't sold to schools. These were consumer machines. And just like they were being sold at like department stores and stuff, they were also sold at some more general electronics chains like Best Buy. During the early 90s, there was a lot of competition between PC clone manufacturers and prices were getting really driven down. There was just intense drive to the bottom kind of pricing. Apple had always been on more of a value type of model, right? They provided both the software and the hardware. They wanted to sell you the entire package, and they felt that that kind of justified a higher price because you were getting everything in one shot, and it was ostensibly a better experience. But even Apple realized that, you know, if their pricing was too far off, people would just go to a PC clone because it was cheaper, even though that may have been not as easy of an experience for someone who isn't exactly computer savvy, Apple couldn't just keep relying on its name. So that's why the Performa series really came out, was to get more Macs out into the marketplace, specifically for consumers, at a bit better of a price than what their more professional or mainstream models would have sold for. And, of course, they also lean on the idea of, well, your kids are probably using an Apple product at school, so maybe you should have one at home, too. And speaking of PowerPC, here's another neat machine that came into FreeGeek recently. A 7100. This is one of the first PowerPC desktops that Apple produced. It's the higher-end model, though. It's the 80 megahertz. The very first ones of these were only 66. This one's also in really good shape, barely any yellowing. So here's the whole setup. I'm not going to power it on because of those leaky caps on the motherboard. I don't know what damage they've already started to cause. I also need to pull that backup battery out. But this is what you would have gotten for a little over two grand back in 1992-ish or so. This wasn't the highest end model, of course, but it wasn't a horrible one either. And it would have done perfectly well at home office kind of stuff, right? Word processing, spreadsheets, playing some basic games, educational titles for your kids. And again, that's really what the Performa series was all about. You weren't gonna pick up one of these to do crazy intensive page layout or graphic design or anything like that. This was a home computer and Apple's thought was, well, if you pick up one of these for home, maybe eventually you'll get a higher end one to do work on or something like that. Anyway, if you like this one, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at This Does Not Comp. And as always, thanks for watching.